This is the time of turmoil. This is the era of war. This is the age of Sigmar. Mini Wargamer Dave here from MiniWargamer.com. Prepare yourself for Warhammer Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition Dominion Unboxing. Ooh, nice artwork. Oh, this plastic smells different. Uh, you know what? It actually does smell different. It doesn't smell like 40K. It smells like Age of Sigmar. Don't ask me why, but I can totally tell the difference. Second piece of artwork. Sprues containing 60 miniatures, which we'll go over in just a moment. New core rulebook. And boy, is it a beast of a book. You ready for it? Watch this. You're welcome, ASMR junkies. And some extra. War scroll booklets combo. Dominion assembly guide. 16 war scrolls. And a start here lore guide, which details the war at Amberstone Watch. Let's not forget the bag o bases. With a couple extra ones in the box, I guess they were too big to fit in the bag. In Age of Sigmar Dominion, you get a new big fat thick third edition rulebook, an assembly guide, an introduction to the lore of the war at Amberstone Watch, two big pieces of artwork, the quick reference war scrolls detailing the stats and abilities for each unit included in Dominion, the bases, and lastly, the 60 unassembled miniatures on sprue. If you wish to see the rest of this unboxing video, with all of the hyper detail surrounding the models and the rulebook, continue watching. To watch a battle report using the 3rd edition rules, click on the link in the video description below. That'll be in the Mini Wargaming Vault. You'll need to be a Vault member to watch that. If you're watching this a couple days after this release, then you can watch a battle report which uses the specific factions in this Dominion starter set. The Stormcast Eternals versus the brand new Cruel Boys. First things first, let's take a look at the models. You want a detail? We're gonna go into detail. Which ones do you want to see first? Stormcast Eternals or Cruel Boys? I'm gonna read the minds of the majority of the people watching this. Cruel Boys it is. Ace Brew, we're looking at you. Starting with Gut Rippers. Got his torso and legs. Improvised shoulder pad. Here's the back part of his torso. Includes his back and a flap to cover his bottom. Next up we have his right arm throwing a spear and then we've got a shield with his head included. And this is what your gut rippers will eventually look like. Let's take a look at an alternate pose. Here's the front part of him which showcases his torso, a portion of his neck, both of his legs, and a portion of his left arm. Next we'll be connecting his back part of his torso with the back flap covering his bottom and his right arm wielding this spear. Got this necklace piece right here and a head with the left shoulder attached. Last thing to connect is the shield and once we have that, we'll have a cruel boy that looks just like that right in the middle. Another alternate cruel boy pose? This one starts out strange. Only half of his body is actually on this. We got his left leg, left part of the torso, and left part of his neck covering. And we got this tiny little sliver here that looks like a loincloth. And here we go, here's the other half of his body, his right leg, right part of his torso, and right part of his jaw. Okay, where's his head? We'll find his head. And we got his shield and his left shoulder pad. Ah, there's his head. It's attached to his right shoulder pad, right arm, that's wielding a spear. Once again, looks all of these cruel boys are right-handed. That's what he looks like fully assembled and painted. This is it, got a fourth one. I said full details. This time it starts with the back half of his body, his torso, lower half, and right leg. And then we jump over to his right arm holding this spear. Again with the right-handedness. This piece is crazy. It includes his shield, his left leg, loincloth, head, and part of his left upper portion cow thingy bit. All this complexity makes up for the fact that he's easy to put together. Cruel Boy variant number five. This time we're gonna start with one half of the back of his torso and his butt covering. And there we go, Cruel Boy, you're starting to flesh out. We got a portion of his left arm, front part of his torso, and mostly his two legs there with the loincloth included. Then we have his full head and the right half of his torso. And then we got his right-handed spear with his left-handed shield. And this angry dude is gonna end up looking like that. Variant number six, how many guys are there? At least this guy is a three-parter. We have his right arm there once again with the spear, the back part of his torso, and to flip it around, most of the front of his torso and his right leg. And his third part includes his full head, the shield, his left leg. See, now that's a curious thing. Look at all that detail in there that's just going to be covered by the model anyway. That's some crazy detail, GW. 
And there's our guy, fully painted. Didn't mean to sing there. Variant number seven. This time with five components. This guy's body was literally sliced in half, with only left everything here, with the exception of his left arm completely missing. But before we worry about any of that, let's not forget his loincloth. And here we are with the right side of his body. Jeez, completely sliced in. It's like that movie Terrifier. Forget I said that. Don't watch that movie late at night with the lights off. Shoulder pad, shoulder pad, shoulder pad, shoulder pad, shoulder pad. Bingo, right on top of the shield. <laughs> and last but not least, we have his right-handed arm attached to the right-handed spear attached to the right shoulder pad in his entire face. Scratch that, it's only the majority of his face. I flipped it around and I saw about a quarter of it missing. And that's that fine little guy right back there. Fine, I'll do variant eight, cause Korn wants it. And this one again, looks like it's five pieces. Half of left back, butt flap. Front of bottom torso, half of upper left arm, both legs. But not his butt, his butt's missing. Another right-handed spear, and a shield. And you know what, I think that's the first time it's a shield all by itself without like a head or a shoulder or a butt flap attached to it. Crazy. And that's gonna be your wee little guy right there. So flipping this over and nine. Well, I guess Zinch wants it. Ah, uh, we got the front part of the torso there with the legs and the back part of the torso. Thank you very much guys for doing it halvesies like that. His spear in the right hand. Look at the kink in his elbow. That's not typical. This guy's a little different. Then we got part of his shoulder pad there. Interesting. Head shoulder shield combo. That's typical. And a random plant that his foot goes in. It's gonna get his boot all wet. And that's that happy little guy right there. And scratch what I said about his boot, he's barefoot, it doesn't even matter. Now for the Grippa boss, there's one of two. You get to choose the variant. Let's go with this guy first. So whether you want to make this into a Gut Rippa boss or another Gut Rippa, it's the same body in either case. Where it varies is the, I was gonna say gun. There's no guns in AOS, unless you're character overlords. But we're not gonna remember those battles. Or you can go with another passive option, which is another Gut Rippa. Necklace for the boss head and shoulder and headpiece for the boss. And then his shield right there, aptly numbered number eight because Korn wants it. And take a look at this on the other side, you got his hand there once more with all of those grips because they won't be seen once it's all painted. You gotta love that detail. And there's the gut ripper boss right there. Your squad of gut rippers assembled but not painted. Your squad of painted gut rippers. And now it's time to look at some wee little hobgrots. Looks like this little guy comes in three pieces. Then snap fits into its base. On this sprue, you'll find the hobgrots. It's lettered H. First two pieces of the boss, we have his back with his right leg and we have his front with his left leg. Let's flip that over and see what we get. What do you know? It's the exact opposite. And then we have his head here, which rounds out the third piece. There are the hobgrots right there. But that's the second variant. That's not the one that I just showed you. That is still the boss. That's the boss right there, where he's got the two daggers pointing down. That's the guy. That guy, right there. And let's face it, that's a good choice for box art. He looks better. The Scrap Totem Bearer. Front armor plate with right leg, and the majority of his body, left leg included, but no head. Neck though, we have located the head. Sweet. And the totem itself. That's what the back looks like. We got a noisemaker. Interesting, you got a hobgrot with a horn, and a hobgrot with a drum. Horn's got three pieces, drum's got four. You got the top of the horn there, with the majority of the body, plus the horn itself attached to the same piece. And the front armor plates with the left leg. For the drummer, you got his drumstick in his hand there, separate from the rest of the piece. Majority of the body holding the drum, back portion of the body with the legs included, and the head. And here's the rest of them. You got various poses, snap fitting all together with fantastic detail, considering how small these guys are. And they're all found on this sprue. That's crazy. It's all the H sprue. And for the Star Wars title sequence, I'll show you the rest of the Hobgrots on Sprue. The Hobgrots assembled, but unpainted. The Hobgrots painted on box art. Let's do the Swamp Color Shaman. And it looks like he's got eight pieces. Bonus points to whoever leaves a comment. Which Chaos God wants this? He'll be located on the F Sprue. Technically on half of it, the portion labeled F. First things first, we gotta attach this massive skull looking thing with poison bombs on the bottom to his ragtag cloak with plants growing out of it. And then we'll slide in the front part of his cloak with his left foot hanging out, of course. And we got the front part of his torso, the staff, plus the, look at that massive hand on it. Is that his, no, that's his hand. Then whose hand is that? Oh, that's creepy. And then we got this piece here. Look at that, he's pouring out some sort of concoction mist. And then just another part of his cloak. Combine next his head 
with the plant. And you get the painted box art version of him. There's a nice shot of the Swamp Color Shaman. Found that in the Start Here Ward Emberstone watchbook. Next up, we got a Pot Grot. Well, that's a funny name for him. So here we have the front part of his body. The pot with his arms and the pot stirrer, plus his head, and then this rack full of goodies. Let's flip it around. Yep, I was right. His head is there. And he's got a little weapon. But I'm pretty sure whatever he's stirring in this pot is actually his weapon. And here's the other part of the pot itself, plus this little swirly bit. Combine it all together and that's what it looks like. Assembled, but not painted. Next up, Merc Knob with Belcha Banna. Well, would you look at that? Onto another sprue. But just half of it, that half. Got the front part of his torso and leg and part of his base with his arm. Oh, he's left-handed, look at that. He's got the weapon in the left hand this time. Looks like we got his head on the very end. And now for the Belcha Banna. That's the front part of it. Lots of detail there. Here's the back of it. And now for the bottom portion of it, showing off the front side. Remembering his plant too. And he's gonna look a little something like that, assembled but not painted. And there he is painted, inside the book this time. Because on the box art, he's tiny. Let's show off some man skewer bolt boys. These are also found in the ice brew. And just to show off a number of these models all at the same time, because they are similar, we have quivers, very cool detail. We have the trigger mechanism and the front portions of the crossbows, more plants, and the fronts of their legs and torsos and heads. Mansky Revolt Boys, assembled but not painted, painted on box art. And now we have the Killaboss, and this is on the D sprue. All right, follow along with me. One, two, three. One, which includes the majority of his body outline, plus his weapon. Two is the front of his torso and leg. Three is the upper back portion of his cape, plus the back of his helmet. That's the helmet, that's the cape. Four, five, six, which includes foot, plant, on a dead enemy. Seven, eight, shield, weapon. Again, left-handed. Looks like there's a common thread here, boys. And let's not forget the wee little stab grot. Shoulder, foot, belly, foot, head, helmet, shoulder, arm, weapon, shield, with arm. Stab grot, kill a boss, unpainted, but assembled. Oh, you sneaky sneaks. Why are you not on the box art? Perhaps it's because you chose to kill a boss on Great Nashfoot? I think so. Back to the eye sprue. Oh, look at the massive two halves of the Nash tooth body. There's the right side. There's the left side. Crazy. Neck plates with the face. Ooh, the underbelly. Tickle, tickle, tickle. And his weapon. Uh, oh, right handed. Okay, now that. You guys keep on going back and forth with the left hand and the right hand and the left. Ah, I, I don't know. No rhyme or reason now. I thought I had it. Now we go back to the right hand. Logic is all messed up in my brain. Where's the Killaboss face? Is it? No, that's not. That's that's definitely not it. Ah, okay. There we go. And the back of it. And he's got himself a shield too. With this piece here, which makes its tongue. Don't believe me? Here it is right here. Killaboss on Great Nash Tooth. Assembled but not painted. Painted on box art. Whew, that was a crazy amount of detail. Let's take a look at the other side. Starting with Yndrasta, the Celestial Spear. It looks like we have some staircase here with a leg on it and another leg with the top part of the staircase. Next, we add in the armor, then the weapons. In the left hand, we have a sword. In the right hand, we have the arm and a spear. Then we'll be adding this tree with the back of this cloak. And then finally we have the wings. One side, the other side. Here's the model assembled but unpainted. And then painted on box art. Next we'll look at the Lord and Peritant. With his little Griff Hound companion. Found on sprue E, which is attached to sprue F. Looking at this side only. That's pretty cool. We have this hammer in the left arm, mace in the right arm. Back of the cloak with some fur up top. Back of the armor piece, one of his legs and also, I'll call it his cape, front part of the armor, and left leg on this little box. Check that out, it's a tiny little kneecap. Got a little dagger on his belt. And then we have this Sigmar halo over the back of his shoulders. Let's not forget this rock. And his head, of course. And then the griff hound coming in a couple pieces. Can't forget the plant. And a pile of bricks. Lord and Peritant and griff hound assembled but not painted. And he's way back there on the box art. Next up, we have the Knight Vexilor with Banner of Apotheosis. 
And it looks like the Knight Vexilar is found on the J-Sprue on this half of it. Looks like this guy comes in four parts. Here's the back of the banner with his rear armor and cloak. Here's the front of it. This is trippy, because that's his right leg attached to his head. Looks like his left leg, but it's not. It's his right leg. Front of his armor, with armor plates and robe in the front. And the fourth piece consists of his left arm, which wields a sword. There he is assembled, but not painted. And now for the fully painted version on the box art. Next up, we have the Knight Arcanum. Found on the sprue lettered C, and D of course, but on the C portion. There's a total of 10 pieces to this miniature. And it consists of the back of the cloak with the armor, staff in the left hand, with two head options. I guess it depends if you want the face covered or not. We have the front of the armor with the left leg included, and the right leg all by its lonesome, as well as the right arm all by itself. But interestingly enough, you get the left shoulder pad all by itself, separated from everything else. Let's not forget this tome, which attaches to the belt. It's for good reading material. As well as this dagger, which also attaches itself to the belt. And lastly, we have this ornamental base. And after 10 sliced up pieces, we have the Knight Arcanum. Assembled, but unpainted. And here's the Knight painted on the box art. Sigmar wouldn't be Sigmar if it didn't have some hard-hitting infantry. Let's take a look at the Annihilators. These as well are found on the J Sprue. Now for this variant, it's all over the sprue. Here you have the left arm and then over here the right arm with the hammer. Got some nice detail there on the hammer. And you can look forward to adding something else to the left arm there. We have the front portion of the torso with the shoulder pads. Two individual legs, which is actually kind of unique considering that in a lot of cases from this box set, a leg is attached to a torso or a cape or something else. And there's the head right there. It gets that shield right there. And it gets this wee little skull, goes on the base. We just looked at the first variant. There is a second variant as well, which is found on the exact same sprue, the J sprue. And then there's an Annihilator Prime, which is slightly different from the other two. The hammer, the armor, the heads, very similar. There is one defining difference though. See that shield right there and the hand on top of it? And that plant, of course. The reason why that's there is because he's got his base on the ground. And here they are painted on the box set. Next up, we're gonna look at the Praetors. Looks like there's three in total, all of which are found on the G sprue. Let's just look at the details of one of these guys. Starting with the cloak, which is really cool. And here's the armor. Look at that, both legs intact. Let's flip it around. Oh, we have part of the torso missing. There's a couple head options. Here's one, here's the other. That's my finger. Then we have this cloth piece that covers the front of the breastplate. And then we've got the weapon, which is interesting because it's held with the right arm, the left hand, and a portion of the cloak over the right shoulder. And there are the three painted Praetors you get, which are on the box set. Obviously, they don't come painted or assembled. My wording was just a little off there. And just as a side note, you've got a couple variants there for the Praetor Prime. Now it's time to look at the Vindictors. Not gonna lie, when I saw that, I saw Vindicator, and I thought to myself, that's not a tank. But I just needed to read a little bit more carefully. For the Vindictors, you have two sprues, both labeled B. They're both the exact same. And because there's so many of these guys, I'm just gonna give you a nice slow pan so you get a general idea of what you get on these sprues. And here are some random close-ups. And here are the 10 that you get in the box. And it looks like they're back there in the box art, which is interesting because it's like, there's only five. Ah, okay, I see, they're in the middle. Start here, war at Amberstone Watch. Let's dive right in. It looks like it's 25 pages of lore. And it starts off with a mantra stirring, detailing the realm of beasts and the wars fought by the forces of order and destruction. More beautifully cinematic model shots and jumping to poison a realm, which details the cruel boy Oryx and the strange events which take place on Thondia as Gazog tumbled through the tumult of the dream. And now getting to the meat of the lore where details regarding the diabolical schemes of the Cruel Boys are revealed at the war at Amberstone Watch. For the fate of Amberstone Watch would be decided here, and all of Thondia's with it. If you're picking this up for the first time, you'll learn about the Stormcast Eternals, who were, of course, chosen by the God King and empowered by the Celestial Tempest. Each model you get in the Dominion box set has lore detailed in this booklet, starting with Indrasta the Celestial Spear, who was once the chieftain of a Gurish nation whose knights rode fierce Pegasi into battle. The Lord and Peritants, who are trained to serve as strategic leaders on a large scale and are not always accompanied by warriors. 
the Knight Vexilor, who have but a single duty to protect the holy battle standards of the Storm Hosts. The Knights Arcanum, who are charged with the protection and recovery of lost knowledge. The Praetors. These champions are bound by oath and soul magic to protect their commanders, who are willing to face the most monstrous foes without pause and sacrifice themselves in an instant to safeguard their liege. The Annihilators. When Sigmar deems that a foe must be crushed into oblivion and banished from memory, he calls for his Annihilators. And Vindictors, who are the proud backbone of a storm host's battle line. And now we jump over to the Cruel Boys. For these dark-hearted greenskins, battle is not solely a means of proving their ardness and honoring the bestial god Gorkamorka. It is also a way to humiliate the righteous and the pure, and the many cunning tricks habitually employed by the Cruel Boys are as spiteful as they are efficient. Kill our bosses! Arrogant and wily rulers of the Cruel Boy war clans, the greenskin warlords known as kill bosses are foes to be feared. Swamp Kala shamans who are the spellflingers and advisors of the Cruel Boys, greenskins in tune with the roiling wah energy that surrounds an auric horde on the warpath. Merc knobs with betcha, belcha, bananas, banas. To approach one of these greenskins is to invite death, either from the toxic fumes emanating from their icon or from the merc knob's brutal cleaver. Gut rippers, who are the most common Cruel Boys sighted on the battlefield and armed with filth-dripping polearms led by their crafty bosses. Man skewer bolt boys, amazing. Who exemplify one of the core principles of the cruel boy mindset. So long as victory is achieved, the means are irrelevant. Hobgrot slitters. Rarely do the cruel boys make war without at least some hobgrots in tow. And though they share many qualities with their gloom spite brethren, such as long flappy ears and a general lack of hygiene, they are more dexterous and organized than most grots. And that concludes what you get in this 25-page lore booklet. Diving into the core rulebook now, this is going to be hyper-detailed, so strap in and enjoy. You ready for it? Sit down, relax, get some popcorn. If this is your very first time looking at an Age of Sigmar video, or you're just learning about the game, this is going to serve as a good overview of the lore, the factions, and the gameplay. Chaos! This 360-page core rulebook includes lore, rules, and gameplay. And let's not forget the artwork as well. It's beautiful, it's glorious, there's a good amount of it, and your eyes will thank you. First, you'll jump into the realms of war, which details the epic setting in which heroes, gods, and monsters clash upon the fantastical battlefields of the mortal realms. You'll learn about starting a force and collecting miniatures. Whether you're collecting an army to play on the tabletop, or you're collecting for display, you'll learn how to choose a faction. Whether you want to start collecting multiple armies, or focus on a single faction, you'll get tips on building and painting your miniatures, which include the different tools of the trade, as well as a step-by-step -step guide to painting your models. You'll learn about the different modes of playing the game, Starting with open play, which is the default setting for games of Warhammer Age of Sigmar. It allows you to set up and play a game with the minimum amount of fuss and preparation. There's narrative play, which is about forging a legend for your miniatures on the tabletop. And match play, which is all about playing games that have been balanced to give no particular advantage to either player. For this reason, it is the most common playstyle used in events such as competitive tournaments. Next, we'll delve into the lore where we learn of the war unending. You'll learn about the Age of Myth and the God King, Lord Sigmar himself, who is often depicted hurling across the cosmos, either taking the form of a twin-tailed comet or emblazoned upon one. You'll dive into the Pantheon of Order. Sigmar Heldenhammer was not the only deity to have manifested in the mortal realms. The old stories tell it was the God King who uncovered the whereabouts of his fellows. These were those gods who had mortal origins in the world before time yet who had achieved apotheosis and now stood as Sigmar's peers. That eventually leads us to the gift of civilization. The times known to men as the Age of Myth were days of unlimited horizons and potential. The realms were replete with resources, both magical and mundane. The power of chaos. I'm not gonna lie, this is the best part. This is my favorite part. I was waiting for this the entire video. Chaos. The four dark gods of chaos have always sought to corrupt and despoil reality. Korn the Blood God, Zinch the Changer of Ways, Nurgle the Plague Father, and Slanesh the Dark Prince. 
you'll learn about a dark god enchained. The gods of chaos are primordial and cosmic, the coalescence of emotions and concepts so powerful they have existed for as long as sentience itself. The Age of Chaos. Soon their whispers were heard in every realm, half imagined, but powerful nonetheless. The Doom Insidious. The Humbling of the God King. This is where we learn that Archeon, the Everchosen, proved Sigmar's truest bane. You'll read about the dying of the light, and Sigmar's people making their exodus to Azir, and his pantheon looking to defend their own territories above all else. The Dominion of Chaos, which are ablaze with fires of hate, which finally brings us to the Age of Sigmar. Just as reality seemed about to splinter apart, a new sun dawned, a new day, cast in the light of the blazing tempest, burned itself into the annals of fate. You'll learn about the Realm Gate Wars and the portals to the unknown. The seeds of hope as hundreds of Realm Gates formed the hubs of the new strongholds. You'll learn about the dark omens and the source of the growing curse upon the realms. That'll bring you to the Soul Wars. And you'll learn about the Arcanum Optimar, which bolstered the power of those who could wield magic to dangerous levels. We'll read about the ascension of a Dark Queen, Morathi. The Shadow Queen of Olgu, who had long desired godhood which next reveals the shining amongst the darkness, which of course leads us to the cursed skies. And Belakor, the Dark Master. Enter the era of the beast. And Kragnos, the prehistoric god, awoken. Our lore plate would not be full if it did not include the mortal realms, which are vast beyond the ken of the human mind, near infinite in scope and defined only by their lethality. You'll learn about Akshi, the realm of fire, and chaos in the great parch, Jiren, the realm of life, or Jiren, I don't know how to say it, which are the lands of unbound life. Grr, the realm of beasts, which is home to the savage wilds. Come on, Shaman, the realm of metal, with its blood and iron. Shaish, the realm of death, and its underworlds at war. Olgu, the realm of shadow, with its blades in the dark. Aish, the realm of light, with its illuminated conflict. Azir, the realm of heavens, with the realm of chaos closely following it. Now that we have a basic understanding of the lore and realms and universe that is the Age of Sigmar, let's dive into the factions. First up, we have the Sentinels of Order, whose armies include the Stormcast Eternals, the Cities of Sigmar, the Seraphim, the Idoneth Deepkin, the Sylvaneth, the Lumineth Realm Lords, the Daughters of Cain the Fire Slayers, the Caradron Overlords, and next we have the Agents of Chaos, which starts with the Slaves to Darkness, the Blades of Corn, the Disciples of Zinch, the Maggotkin of Nurgle, Hedonites of Slanesh, the Skaven, the Beasts of Chaos. Next we have the Bringers of Death, starting with the Soul Blight Grave Lords, the Flesh Eater Courts, Night Haunt, Asiarch Bone Reapers. And next we have the Harbingers of Destruction. Starting with the Gloom Spike Gits. Uruk War Clans. Ogre Ma Tribes. Sons of Behemet. 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 They're, they're big giants. And that includes the various factions included in this miniature war game. Let's take a look at the rules just briefly, just an overview, just to give you an idea of how much detail there is in this miniature war game. This will not be a comprehensive how to play, but rather an overview of what you get in this rulebook. In this, you'll learn about the core rules, three ways to play, the conquest unbound, and the Age of Sigmar player's code, which include the cardinal rules, always be polite and respectful, and always tell the truth and never cheat. In this section, you'll learn about the core rules, which include the factions, battle tomes, and battle packs, the models, of course, units, war scrolls, keywords on the war scrolls, unit coherency, armies, your general, endless spells, invocations and faction terrain, friendly and enemy models, removed from play, all of this stuff is included here. It's going to mean nothing to you if you're brand new to this, but if you're not brand new to this, you're going to know it anyway. That's why you should get the book. You'll learn about the battlefield and deployment, the battle rounds and the turn sequence. You'll discover the hero phase as well as the movement phase. This part will detail unit coherency and remaining stationary. 
as well as how these models interact with terrain. You'll learn about the shooting phase and the charge phase, as well as the combat phase. Who strikes first? Who strikes last? The fight sequence, as well as piling in and combat attacks. You'll learn about picking your targets and shooting attacks. You'll learn about your combat attacks and number of attacks and combined attacks. The attack sequence. You'll learn all about attacking here. You'll learn about wounds and allocating them. When models are slain, healing wounds, mortal wounds, and wards. You'll discover the battle shock phase and ending the round of battle. You'll learn more about the terrain and scenery rules and the different types of terrain features. Here we gain wisdom about objectives and controlling them. Gonna learn about the wizards because they are different. They are their own thing. They can cast spells. They can unbind skells. They can also miscast. There are endless spells that exist. They can be summoned. They can be dispelled. They can be removed. You'll learn about priests enchanting prayers. You'll learn about invocations and removing and banishing and summoning invocations. You will learn about monsters and rampaging and what happens when they roar or stomp or titanic duel or smash to rubble. You're gonna learn all about war scrolls and what they mean, such as his name and type, the characteristics, rend modifiers, saves of random characteristics. You'll discover pitched battle profiles. And next you'll learn about battalions and core battalions, what unit icons are, what battalion ability icons are, as well as these lovely universal enhancements. Can't forget the battle packs and instructions that go with it and the mysterious terrain and all of the scenery rules that go with it, as well as the battle plans and the special rules and the lengths and the victory conditions. And quite randomly, you'll learn about Ben Johnson's Sons of Behemoth, which, if you ask me, are pretty darn gorgeous. Next, you'll learn about open play and what that means exactly. Just because you can pretty much do whatever you want, it doesn't mean there aren't points limits as a default. But when preparing the battlefield, there's an open war battle plan generator, which gives you a map, the victory condition, a twist, and a ruse. It also details the deployment and the game length. Here is the map table, which you can roll randomly on to determine which deployment you'll be using. Here we have the victory table and the conditions upon which you can win the game. We also have the twist and ruse tables as well as the arcane prize table. Hello Thomas Elliot's death army! Next we'll jump into narrative play and the different campaigns you can run, the path to glory, and the battle packs, as well as other ways to explore narrative play. There is a built-in campaign system Path to Glory, which gives you all of the rules that you will need in order to play this with your friends or with opponents, anyone who will fight you. It goes step by step on choosing a faction and realm. You choose your starting size and your territories, as well as the order of battle. You'll next focus on your core enhancements, as well as picking your first quest. And how convenient we have the quests which follow right after. It tells you what to do after you have played and the campaign bookkeeping you'll need to do in order to advance and continue the campaign. Ah, look at that, they have injury rolls. So things that happen in the game matter and have lasting effects. Looks like there's some veteran abilities that can be applied to heroes. Scratch that, it only applies to units that are not heroes. Interestingly enough, when you say don't think of elephants, you think of elephants. You'll learn how to complete quests and manage your stronghold and manage your territories, and this wouldn't be complete unless we had a table of territories that you can choose from. Hello, Sam Pearson's Blades of Corn. Why didn't I see this yet? I guess it's because this is the first time I'm seeing it, and it had to have happened sometime. Here are the different narrative play missions that exist. Gives you a deployment map, the armies that you'll muster, what the battlefield will look like, what the terrain will be, your deployment, the objectives that'll be used, the length of the game, what happens in the first turn, the victory points and conditions, and the glorious victory afterwards. And next, we have the matched play rules. With match play, you'll determine the points limit of your armies before you battle each other. The factions and the general that you have, the endless spells and invocations that are included, under strength and reinforced units, applied units. Let's not forget allied units, as well as faction terrain and battalions. And last but not least, we have the special rules. There's battle tactics as well. All that we learn before jumping into the match play scenarios of which there are three. Hello, Jess Bickham's Lumineth Realm Lords. And this now brings us to Conquest Unbound. This is another way in which you can play this game. It includes some pre-game bookkeeping, as well as some battle plans. Here we have Triumph and Treachery, which rules allow three or more armies to take part in a multi-sided battle. And finally, that brings us to the Rules Index, which alphabetically lists 
everything that is included in this core rulebook. Thank you very much, GW, for making it very convenient. We also have Path to Glory rosters back here, which you may photocopy for personal use. And the very last page is an army roster, which again, you're able to photocopy. That is the core rulebook. Thank you very much, guys, for tuning in to this unboxing of Dominion 3rd Edition Age of Sigmar. If you want to watch a battle report where we use the 3rd Edition rules, then click on that link in the video description below. You'll need to be a Vault member to watch that. If you're watching this video a couple days after its original release, then there will also be a battle report where we use the Cruel Boys versus the Stormcast Eternals, the exact models found in this box set, fighting each other, and then you can see what that looks like, because that gives you a very clear, specific example of how this game plays out, and how the rules are, and how it feels, and the fun that is to be had. That's in the link in the video description below. Thank you very much for all of your support. Be sure to subscribe to the channel for more Age of Sigmar coverage, and continue watching throughout this week, and next week, and the week after. There's going to be a lot of coverage for this game. It is pretty exciting, and it's pretty cool. Me personally? Path of Glory speaks to me. Uh, that's what I want to do. There's many ways in which you can play this game, obviously. And that one calls to me, and uh, let's see, Chaos calls to me as well. Which Chaos army should I field in Path of Glory? Which one would you field if you were playing Path of Glory? How would you play this game? What are the different game modes that speak to you? If this is your very first time looking at all this stuff, which army do you think you like the most? If we're going by a rule of cool, 100%, you know nothing about anything else, only the aesthetics of the models, which one would you collect and why? This is the time of turmoil. This is the era of war. This is the age of Sigmar. And everything you get in the Dominion box set.